talk about, you know, you're developing a comedy series. Do you feel at all constrained in the kind of material that you can tackle? I mean, watching your shows, there is such a range. Of course, Jill, you really, in Transparent, really, really broke some ground. Writing for a medium like Amazon, did you feel like you had a certain amount of freedom to, to go there as you did in the show? Um, yeah, I do. I, uh, I've always sort of considered myself both a, a comedy and a drama writer, and I guess the 30 minutes thing appears to be the sort of main delineator right now. I feel like Transparent could actually be a 60 minute show, but I really, I look to shows like Louie and Girls for the tone and think that, um, you know, for me, I'm always just going for the real moments. I, I, try, to, I try to cast people who make me laugh. And then when I'm directing and writing, I'm trying to make it feel real. When you came to Jane the Virgin, did you, was there any scenario that you considered it being a half an hour, or was it always an hour in your mind? It was no, always an hour because of the amount of storytelling we wanted to do in, uh, in the show. Also, we were on the CW, which didn't have half hours at the time. But it was, I always wanted it to be a really uh, sort of meaty emotional journey that the character would take it on with like a lot of wacky and whimsical, but you would understand this one, one girl and her, her struggle. So we, we break it, we, bake, we break the drama part of it, we break the comedy, we m always have to make sure we know what the set pieces are and what we're building to and we have a vocabulary that allows us, you know, to go on big flights of fancy and, and you know, have wrestling interludes and all kinds of uh, craziness. You got so much out of those characters that, that <laughs> could have potentially otherwise be, been a little two-dimensional. And you just made them such human. You know, we, we really try to take, um, I encourage all the writers, and I do it, just take a real pass at every script from every character's point of view as though they're the hero. And that just, you know, so you're not just looking and seeing how Petra's going to uh, twist this character and be the plot device that makes Jane go here, but what is she thinking, what is she wanting, and uh, you know, what are things in her world that will make her more frustrated, which will be more funny. Um, and so we really just try to take what the audience thinks they're going to see and subvert it a little. And as long as we can understand it and uh, find the emotional realness to it, we feel like we can do anything, which is really freeing. You know, I mean, there was one, one small thing I got I wasn't allowed to do this year. You know, a little whimsical, little incest story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, other than it was that, too hot. I, I, I didn't think it was that hot. <laughs> I thought it was um, whimsical. <laughs> whimsical. Incest? It was whimsical. Um, other than that, we we can kind of go for anything. So that's really freeing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to that. Adam, can you talk about? Uh, your show and the, the, the development of, I know it's so personal and grounded. Yeah, I mean, look, I set out to do a, a, a network family comedy. Um, uh, as far as constraints, like I'm on ABC, so they have a brand, um, Disney friendly. So the, the, you know, I, the constraints that I get, I, and, and I'm not looking to do anything really edgy. I, I want it to be a, a show that uh, parents and their kids can watch, but you know, most of our notes are about Jeff Garland's balls. That's basically it. Like when he walks around in his underwear. Um, it, 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 and the, it, because we are doing Too family, hot. Yeah, too hot, too hot. Um, we actually had to his, outfit him with a cod piece, ultimately. Because his whimsical, whimsical balls. His whimsical <laughs> balls. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're doing family comedy. I got, you know, you, you know uh, always negotiating. One of the things was I, I wanted uh, Beverly, the mom, to always drop an F-bomb every show, because that's what my mom does every conversation. So uh, it's stuff like that. And you know they didn't want parents cursing at their kids. And it, that's a constant negotiation. ABC backing down. Sometimes we lose. I wasn't allowed to say poop twice. <laughs> I was saying once was OK. Once was OK. So it's, um, yeah, you know, network, network comedy. It's, um, I'm not looking to reinvent every, anything. I, I, I just I want it to be family friendly, but also sometimes you know, push a little bit. There, there's a sweetness to the show that does seem rare, in, especially in network TV right now. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I initially developed it for Fox, and, and the pilot was more or less for Fox. And it was going to be, I, I met like an expose of my crazy, the way I was raised and my parents. and. Then I went to ABC, and I kind of still was in that Fox mind frame. And, um, and then I realized after 
critics watched it initially and it was really polarizing, <laughs> that I did decide, let's do the Wonder Years after the pilot, let's make it super universal. Um, and that was a real, and, and I think that decision is why the show is still on. I think if it was, um, I want to do a lot, initially a lot really edgy and a lot of sex and just something that would, that would work on like next to the new girl or something. Um, and that's once I went over and I realized I'm, I'm with, you know, going to be potentially with Modern Family or the middle that it just had to be a different kind of show. Mm -hmm. So I definitely changed the tone. And was that, was that a hard decision for you to make or was it? Um, no, because I, once I kind of realized I had to just tap in and make it everyone's experience, um, you know, you, we could tell really sweet stories that I think I wouldn't have told otherwise because, um, so yeah, I think it was kind of freeing in a way that I didn't have to feel like I had to be edgy or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, now, on the flip side of that yeah. equation, uh, survivor's remorse, I think it's within either the first three or four minutes, your lead character says to a, a group of people at a press conference, to his mother, Thank you for not aborting me. It's a fair thing to thank Pause. your mother for. <laughs> but that Being how accepted, uh, you know, uh, abortion is a thing that happens a lot. So he's, he's um, I'll let you finish the he's, question, he's, sorry. He's, I'm, already de I'm already defending him thanking for his ab not being aborted. No, I mean, it, but it, it set a tone for a, a show in, in a half hour form that was going to be very uh, provocative and very... Yeah, I think that what we were trying to do is, you know, I had, uh, and I had really learned a lot about working on a show and being a writer on a show. I had, I had been a staff writer the previous four years on Shameless, which is a, you know, a very um, animated writer's room, and we tell a lot of, uh, we told a lot of, you know, very, you know, interesting, passionate, crazy stories. And, I, and there was a lot of dark humor, but you know, one of the th reasons I was attracted to writing Survivor's Remorse, it's about a professional basketball player and what his life is like uh, you know, off screen. So if he was going to present himself, you know, very uh, capable person who says all the right things at a press conference, uh, what would happen if he said the wrong things? I think that's an interesting you know, for, for this show, I thought that was an interesting area is what happens when a guy, when the cameras are not on a star professional, you know, athlete, how do they behave? And seeing somebody who is at, you know, the, uh, the, the beginning parts of his career, he's got to make some mistakes. Your characters in your show also, um, you know, part of the conceit is that the, the, this is um, a young man coming from one world coming into a lot of money and you know very suddenly and dealing with all that you use a split screen effect in in a lot of the show that really yes. emphasizes that sense of two worlds was that something that you were really trying to you know that was something that uh yeah, actually the the dp um oliver bokelberg came up with and the direct the guy who directed the uh, first two episodes of our first season ken whittingham they they brought that in as a, you know, visually, you know, as, as part of uh, the experience of, of shooting and then producing and editing the show that I thought was great. It really added something. You know, the, the show is about a guy who suddenly comes into money. He's a young basketball player and he takes his family with him and the mistakes that they make. And so this idea of, you know, survivor's remorse being that, you know, they came from someplace and they're, you know, the, where they came from, there are still people that they could throw this life raft to or a life preserver to and that you know if they've survived and they've got out but there's just so many people they can help and that burden that they feel and so it's something that we try to go back to again and again mm -hmm. because it adds this real strain on these characters for any of you can you talk about what were some of the toughest characters to nail in your shows in your respective shows jill i don't know i, should, I feel like i should pass I, I i felt very very much in the pilot and throughout that um the actors were like the exact right person. Like Jeffrey Tambor was perfect and Gabby Hoffman was exactly who I wanted. And as soon as I was able to get them the scripts and see the stuff up on its feet, it was all, it, they always felt like the right people. Um, toughest to nail. I mean, I mean, even in the writing process when you were conceiving? Yeah, we, you know, um, we had to get the trans stuff right. You know, that was a very, very big deal because this was, you know, a couple years ago and we were really, trying to um, 
tell more of story, but not fall into any of the trans tropes. So we had a lot of consultants, and in particular Jenny Boylan and and um, Zachary Drucker. And there's things that trans women in particular are really sick of seeing, like people staring in the mirror and putting on lipstick, and you know, just all being about beauty and all being about the presentation of femininity. So we. We really, like, we didn't want to do any of that stuff. We didn't want to have any of Maura's stories be about, did I pass? So we sort of nixed all those stories. Um, and we really wanted to just tell a sort of very human story. And we really wanted to keep her, in some ways, the sane one, so that the kids could really be the fucked up people. And then also, when we first, it's so interesting, when we first started writing it, we sat with the trans consultants. Uh, Jenny Boylan came and she drew something on the board for us, which she called, okay, this is the trans brella. These are all the people who fall under the category of trans. And in particular, trans women get confused with cross-dressers and drag queens, and here's the difference. And we need to make sure we're telling a story about a trans woman and not a story about a cross-dresser or a drag queen. And um, then we really found that as we started to tell Maura's story and that her story was gonna involve what she had been up to for the previous 50 years, that the cross-dressing story had to be told. Can you, I mean, um, can you believe that the, the, the timing of Transparent coming, that the, the I, you know moment? I can't. I was, I was at the airport today. It was almost. You know? I was at the airport today, and um, I was talking to the guy in customs, and um, I sa I, he said, what were you doing in Banff? And I said, I was at a television festival. And he said, oh, what do you do? I said, I create TV. Oh, what's your show? I said, it's called Transparent. He said, what's it about? And I said, a woman whose parent comes out as transgender. And he goes, oh, like Bruce Jenner. And I was like, yes, I talked to Bruce Jenner. I talked to Caitlin. And yeah, the, show, the show really was kind of the reason that they came out. Uh, and I was like, I'm just joking. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I'm like, I have nothing to do with that. But the truth was, like, and then my sister and I were, were true, like, we're walking, walking, and my sister works on the show as well. And we think about where we were three years ago with this story, where I, two years ago with this story where I was sort of like, can I tell this story? Will I be able to move through the world with people knowing that my parent is trans? And, and, and even like a little bit of shame, like it, I was kind of afraid and my parent was afraid. And now Kim, Kardashian and Chloe and Kendall and Kylie, we're all the same. <laughs> <laughs> we, all, we all have the same thing going on. And yeah, it's totally normal. It's crazy. You were ahead okay. of your time. It's totally crazy. Yeah. <laughs> was there, a, I would imagine, that as part of the process, was there a lot of education for yourself or yes, for your family? Yes, tons, yes. There was, there was a big controversy over, over this um, New York Times op-ed that came out uh, over the weekend. There's, you know, there's this kind of vague infighting that's happening between the feminist community and trans women. And, and, and honestly, it is a very small minority of, of women, for the most part, feminists and trans women get along. But this feminist conversation is like really starting to rise up. Are you talking about the, the, the focus of the looks of Caitlyn. Right, is what, yes, you know, there was a, there was, yes. been a lot of discussion. Yes, and whether or not, and, and what makes a woman, and you know, this is a conversation we hope to have um, season two, but this is, so anyway, oh, what I wanted to say is there is a book called Whipping Girl by Julia Serrano, and for me, I feel like once somebody reads Whipping Girl, you can't really have that argument anymore. She's so succinctly, and I, I bought like hundreds of copies, gave it to everybody on my set. It really sort of exactly um, pinpoints the difference between trans misogyny and transphobia, that people don't really have issues with trans men in the same way they do with trans women, and that femininity and the presentation of femininity is sort of this kind of, uh, everybody feels like they get to weigh in on whether or not somebody should or shouldn't be attractive, and it's, it's about being attractive to men, um, and that totally changed me. It completely transformed me, and it, it, it gave the show a sort of a trans feminist perspective that I, 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 I hope that everybody gets a chance to read. Back to the character question, any? any... Um, uh, for me, it, it's pretty simple. It's, I didn't have a sister. Mm. Um, so that one was tricky. Um, uh, when, when I, when I uh, created the show, it wasn't the Goldbergs. It was, the, it was like based off my family and I showed Polly um, a bunch of my home videos, and he kind of, when he picked it up, he said, I want to call it the Goldbergs. And then it was like, all of a sudden, it's the Goldbergs, and I don't have a sister. <laughs> um, so that was really, that was really tricky. Um, so what I ended up doing was bringing in a lot of my oldest brother's characteristics, the, the um, rebellious, like, um, w what I said to the writers, I said for this character, my parents surprised him with a trip to uh, Europe for graduating, and he refused to go because he didn't want to be controlled. So I, 
<laughs> so, and it, I have it on video. Um, I have, it's a Thanksgiving, and he storms out of Thanksgiving. I aired the video this year. So you're trying to control me, this is bullshit. So that was tricky. And the other thing that's hard is, I think my, so what I did was I also leaned on the, on the, the women in the room to tell lots of stories, and we incorporated that into Erica. So I think we figured out uh, her quickly. And then the other thing that's tough for my writing staff is because they'll pitch great ideas and I'll just go, you know, um, my dad would never hang curtains. He'd hire a guy to do it. So, uh, so that's, ah. I think, <laughs> so I think that's the tough thing for, uh, I, everyone else I know, I know exactly what they would do. Um, and the writers are kind of sometimes frustrated because I really try to stick to the truth of who the people are. Jenny, anybody in particular in the Jane the Virgin world that was hard for you to really crack as a character, whether in the writing or in the casting? The character of Raphael was the hardest for me. Um, who, who is this person that keeps inspiring people to steal his sperm? You know, he's <laughs> got to have a certain je ne sais quoi. Um, <laughs> And I, I he, he, you know, he's this golden boy who had this very serious thing happen a while ago, and a lot of people were acting at him and manipulating him. So I found it hard to figure out who he was besides the prize that the girls were trying to get. And it, it took the longest time. It took the longest time to find the actor. Mike, who was the who, in in the cam world? Who was the hardest for you? Given my extensive professional basketball experience that um, <laughs> you know, the lead character who's about a pro basketball player I uh, I was a power forward in eighth grade that was the last time I played and um, that was probably it was probably the biggest challenge the character has a big heart uh, and he's big mouth. and and yeah he's he's a he's a great character it was it, it's hard to find that balance and of course what's interesting is that when we break a story, uh, LeBron James, who's one of the executive producers, right. you're like, we got some really great stories, and then LeBron would be like, that would never happen, and you can't be like, what do you, how, what do you know? You know what I mean? <laughs> so, yeah, it's gonna happen in this show because we don't have another story right now. So, <laughs> what was good is that we were breaking a lot of the stories this year while he was in the middle of the playoffs. So, uh, <laughs> so it's like, uh, yeah, I think he, yeah, I talked to LeBron. Yep, this is, uh, this is a great story for us. <laughs> But that is a question. I mean, did he have a certain veto power over... Oh, sure, yeah. Him? I mean, when we first we went down to his house and he read the lead character and did a reading of it and his friends uh, did a reading of the other parts and they were great. And, and there's certainly stuff that, uh, that you know, he's been, you know, very, uh, you know, open-minded and very liberal and, 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 you know, his comments too. I mean, he he's a big supporter of the show and a fan of the show and I think we've been very clear about the idea that, you know, to really do this story right, it's a show not taken from his life, but it's, you know, it's fake people in a fake situation. I and that's the feeling the uh, Goldberg's it. writers would like for you to come visit the... <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. You know how that yeah. works. <laughs> <laughs> Commitment to being a showrunner on this show, does it, is it tough, tough to, to uh, juggle acting work? Yeah, that you it, want to it is. Uh, it was great when I was on Glee, uh, which is when this started and and that was one of the things that I was working for John Wells on Shameless and he was great because he let me go to do Glee whenever I had to and um, Ryan Murphy same thing he let me write when when I wasn't doing episodes and so this idea came about when I was still doing Glee uh, but yeah it's a it's a different thing I obviously can't go up for acting jobs when I'm in the middle of doing this and right. you know it's about seven or eight months the commitment to a season but I'm loving it. Mm -hmm. Is there anything on a previous show, either something that didn't work or something that did work on a, on a show that you learned that you feel like really helped you get to where you are with these shows today? Yeah, I, um, I'm always trying to sort of like honor and imitate Alan Ball's leadership style and how he ran the room on Six Feet Under. He had just some sort of basics. Um, you know, we worked from 10 to four. It was super chill. Really long lunch. First, you know, hour was talking about what we watched on TV the night before. If anybody had a doctor's appointment, he'd be like, it's just a TV show. Of course you can go to the doctor. He was just like super sweet and kind and made it so that everybody really wanted to be there and we really enjoyed each other. And he really kind of almost curated the kind of um, support group feeling of the writer's room where we really 
wanted to tell each other what was happening in our lives. And then we were able to get those moments, these scenes, these stories, these confessions for each other and get them up on the board. You know, we don't have, we don't have computers in the room. We don't have phones in the room. We, we, we work in 50 minute chunks four times a day or five times a day. And I, I completely a hundred percent wanted to run a show and wanted to run a show exactly the way he did it when I was finished working on six feet under. I had a show before the Goldbergs called breaking in. Um, it was with Christian Slater, star Christian Slater, literally the nice, my favorite person in the world. He, this guy's unbelievable. I he's, did a show with him. He's, he's Christian Slater is the, you want him to be as guy. cool as you hope. And he's like a he, billion he, times cooler. He's unbelievable. He's the best. So Seriously. I really loved him so much. And I just wanted to <laughs> go into work every day and be like, Heather's what's up. Like <laughs> that's why I had the show. Um, and um, so I, I, I really wanted this show to work, and it hold, I think it holds the record with Family Guy for the numbers of times it's been, it was canceled. You, you it would, couldn't kill it. <laughs> I literally like, would be canceled and be picked up, and the network was just so confused by it. Um, it was the, I pitched it as the A-team meets the office, so they were like, what is this? <laughs> we, we has Christian Slater, and we love that, but what else? So I was so um, fachotted, as my mom would say, that I, I, I didn't know, I, at a certain point, I was looking at the writers like, I, what is this? What are we doing? And they're like, you're the boss, you tell me. So I, I called, um, I hope I'm not speaking on turn. I called Greg Garcia, who's a writer that I, I think is amazing. I, I admire him. He's He also is an unbelievable great guy. Yeah, the best. He's like one of the best. So I called him and I'm like, how do I do this? How do I be a showrunner? My show is falling apart and every week it's different. And, and he gave me the best advice ever, um, which was, well, what do you think the show is? Sit in the note sessions, nod and go, dude, I love that. And then just do what you want. And then at a certain point, you got to shoot it. And then they'll go, but what about the thing? You go, yeah, we couldn't make it work. <laughs> um, so I was like, oh. So my show died, ultimately, and, and the Goldbergs happened. And that's, I went in with that attitude. Not to say that I don't listen to the notes, but it really was Greg that kind of gave me this lesson on, at the end of the day, just be proud that it was your thing. And, and I look back at that break-in experience, and it just, it's like a missed opportunity. It'll always, it'll always bum me out. It was uh, two things w that happened at the can when my uh, previous show was canceled, um, which was called Emily Owens, and it was a medical drama. And my dad called me when the show was canceled and was just like, you know, Jen, I liked it. I liked it. But I just think next time you could do something a little more original. <laughs> I, it hurt. <laughs> you know, and I, so I was like, first, I, you know, I was like, Dad, you know, it's really hard to get a show on the air. And you know, he told me, like, do something like 24. <laughs> And I was like, so then I was like, I don't write like that, Dad. And like 24, they have 24. So if I do it like in 12 hours, it's not good. It's done. And then, um, but it like, it sat in my gut for a, a while. And I just realized what he was saying is just like, don't write what you think will get on. Kind of swing for the fences a little bit um, in terms of storytelling. And it just, it, it was kind of one of those things that just sat in my gut. And when I went to do the next project, I didn't think it was going to get on. I didn't think Jane was going to get on, but I was like, I'm going to go crazy on this one and like do a lot of different things and see if it works. And um, so, you know, that backhanded, uh, no, just like straightforward insult really <laughs> spurred me. <laughs> I guess it was pretty good advice. Yeah. <laughs> Mike? Uh, you know, as, as Adam was saying about uh, Greg Garcia, he was a showrunner with Alan Kirschenbaum on a show that I did called uh, Yes, Dear. And Greg was just an incredibly positive person. Uh, relentless in his work ethic, uh, amazingly funny. Anytime you pitched him an idea, he'd uh, make your idea better and funnier. I learned a tremendous amount uh, from him just on how to be in terms of running a show and how to interact with actors. Um, and then when I'm working on Shameless, John Wells, who uh, you know has had so much success but who really cares about writing and the relentless uh, pursuit of a good idea. John really does a great job of trying to uh, bring out the best in you. Uh, I learned a lot from him when, when writers would argue in the writer's room. Uh, he would let writers argue, and then he'd realize there's something here, because you guys are arguing about it. Um, and he, especially on Shameless, uh, said, you know, 
try not to make any moral judgments about your character. Try to put them in a circumstance and have them uh, go through that circumstance, and then it will be compelling for the people who are watching it. And then he's just, he is relentless in trying to make something great. And so uh, you're just constantly writing and rewriting and working and working over and over again. Uh, and trying to finish your scripts on time so you can produce them so that you don't have the pressure of uh, being under bu uh, over budget because you can't get the, the thing done on time. So you know, I've been very blessed in that. I've, I've been able to work with you know a couple guys like that who really are just great guys and, and work very, very hard. So they lead by example.